All right. Let's kick it off. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Craft Podcast, where we interview experts in all kinds of different fields to learn about their disciplines, how they strive towards mastery. And uh, Michael and I, we love talking to people who are passionate enough to master something. And we've each been asking curious questions of these craftspeople our whole lives. And we want to share those conversations with others. Um, so you will love all these interviews. Please be sure to click the subscribe button to follow our channel if you like our interviews. Um, and today we have a really special guest, um, William Entrican, um, somebody who uh, uh, I know pretty well. And um, yeah, let's get right into it. Michael. All right. Uh, today we're joined by William Entrican. William is a total polymath. And where do we start, right? So he's a technologist, live streamer, app developer, um, runs a healthcare training business, does board door uh, photography, and also authored a science fiction novel and learned Mandarin Chinese fluently from scratch. And he's best known for uh, in the world of uh, blockchain as the lead author of ERC-721, which is the groundbreaking standard that laid the foundation <clears throat> for the FT we know today. And his work uh, has transformed the landscape of digital ownership and asset uh, tokenization. And always eager to engage with the blockchain community, William uh, regularly answers queries during the NFT and Web3 community service hour. He and Dan uh, host on every Tuesday uh, at 6 p.m. New York time. And we will share that link under our description so you can check it out and be part of it. And also he contributes actively to uh, various question platforms. So today we're looking forward to delving into his journey and discussing uh, the evolution of the future of NFTs and also extracting some insights from his vast experience in this field. And we're honored to have William on the show. And William, welcome to the Craft Podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. So first question, the origin story. What signs were there that young young William would, would grow up to be such a Renaissance person. At origin of the origin. Very the beginning. origin of the origin. Yeah. So I'll give you, I'll give you two stories. So the one was my neighbor. I, I learned to speak late in life. Like I was about four until I started really talking. Four. And before then it was just words or in clips and phrases, but that's when I really started going at it. And it wasn't very far after that until I started doing basic. So <laughs> I, my neighbor had this, I, don't, I, I guess I should hunt down. Basic, the programming language. Yep. And yeah. it's a it's a computer. I mean, you have to call it a computer, but it runs off of a cassette tape. And there were, I think there were two cassette tapes in there. Like you would pop in a cassette tape, you would turn it on and it would run basic. That's all it would do. And I, I for history, I should really get one of these, but I guess my English to basic like the English started late, the basics started early. So that was, you know, that was one sign is that I was here to learn, to study, to, to program, to, you know, to work with. Um... Well, anyway, the second story, I'm not, I'll just do <laughs> the facts. You, you write the interpretation. The second story is about my dad. A few years later, I was in my room and my dad had an office next to my room. And this is Bill from people that also are on the other podcast. Yo, dude. Every week. Yo, dude. And you do so 38 right there. And my room's here. And I was, I don't know, seven, eight, something like that. And I decided, I, I made the decision for the family that I was going to have a phone in my room <laughs> because, you know, I wanted to call my friends whenever I wanted. I want to have to go to the kitchen. And so I went downstairs and I got the drill and I figured, okay, well, if I could just drill a hole through the wall at the baseboard, then I can fish a wire through. I can split the wire somehow and I can get a phone in my room. That was the goal. So I'm in my How room. How old were you? Eight? Seven, eight, something like that. Oh, man. And so I, so I go down, I get the drill and I start drilling. And my dad comes in and he walks in the room and he sees what's going on. He sees me drilling a hole through the wall. He, I got the phone cord laid out. I got the phone there like red handed. I didn't know why I thought I was going to away with this. And he walks in there and he says, Will, what are you doing? Take that back downstairs right now. 
and get a bigger bit. You're not going to drill anything with that bit. <laughs> do a circular bit. That's a pin bit. You're not going to do anything with that. <laughs> and of course, I had a bit that was like this big, like trying to go through the. I got to check. Right. And that is, yeah, on the money. So I went downstairs, got the right bit through the hole, and then split my wire. And then I got my phone. So support from the beginning, you know, breaking the boundaries, understanding, you know, that you can do a lot of things in this world if you just do it and then you just start drilling. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That was great. And so then you got the phone? I got the phone. I got the phone. <laughs> and then the phone was a whole thing, you know, because, you, you, you know, back in the day, you used to do a lot more fun things with phones than you can do now. But yeah, that was, that was the beginning. Wow. What do you think was it that, that drew you to do that kind of tinkering? Um, well, my parents were split in when I was, I don't know, seven, six or seven. So I always had a lot of different perspectives, like going back and forth. Mm -hmm. And we split 50, 50. So two weeks here, two weeks there, my whole life. And that really gave me the perspective of like listening to one person and then not listening to that person for a while. I got that really <laughs> early in life, but as mm -hmm. an adult, you really pick up on that. It's like, as a, you know, there's the child learning phase and there's adult learning phase. And as a child, you're supposed to like listen to your parents all the time until you realize that you know more than them. And then you become <laughs> an adult. That's whenever that happens. But as a child, I learned that there's a lot of perspective because I didn't have and also I didn't have this thing like some kids who have parents that are split, they, you know, they're, they're with the one parent most of the time, except for the token amount and the other time. I didn't have that. Right. I was 50, 50 the whole way. And really just flipping and flopping on these perspectives really gave me a lot to start with in life. So I always came in, I wasn't on the punk scene, but I was definitely, and I wasn't on the anarchist scene, but I definitely had the cookbook and I definitely <laughs> had all of the things that, you know, these two, I went to the, I was on these scenes, right. Um, not admitting to anything that anarchists do, but <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely from a lot of perspectives from childhood, something that people don't usually get until adulthood. And so from there, I learned that you can really question what people are telling you and you really have to make for yourself. You make the ideas in your head. So the ideas, the influences come from the outside, but the ideas come from within. And then the ideas can manifest through your hands into the world. That's something I learned earlier than a lot of people and mm. so really you know if i'm a master of something then it's building or it's open source i mean that's that's later in life but just the understanding that you can make things that's the powerful thing that not everybody gets in life right yeah and as you got older so you were you were tinkering with these things at some point you must have discovered the internet Yep, through the modem. What was that like? Yes, yeah, so BBS. So back in, so my first connection with the internet was through uh, modems. So you would, uh, this is in the 90s. So you would get the modem, but then like a few weeks later, you have to get the next modem because they were just getting better constantly. <laughs> and so I got the modems and then you would have to dial into things. So those were the BBSs, which I guess are basically like discords right now. Right? Same exact thing, but you'd have to dial you, you dial into them. There are phone numbers attached and yeah. identically the same thing. They're all based on the same concept, decades and decades of the same idea. So you dial in and you would trade files or talk to people. And so I had pen pals when I was, you know, nine years old or under, you know, pen pals that my parents didn't know about. And I guess <laughs> that is the pen pals were different back then because you had less of them and they weren't people screaming at you. They were people that wanted to talk to you. Right. Uh, and it was private conversations. Now, if you can say that people have pen pals, they are with random people that don't care about you and are very likely robots. <laughs> yeah. So that was well, my or, beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, so eventually, of course, you have to kind of make some decisions about what to study and what to do. Um, what was that like going through college and then you did... Uh, graduate school, which was actually where where we met at Drexel back many years ago in Philadelphia. Yeah, so I was in. I learned about Linux in high school. That was interesting. So I mean, that, that's my beginning of my open source life. And then 
I decided to get into electrical and computer engineering and math for undergrad. And mm-hmm. that was, that was the, um, that was the idea I had in my head. I thought that engineering was hard to get into and that it was more of a, more of a real, a real study <laughs> versus some of the other things that are offered out there. This is before we used the word STEM, you know, back then everybody was equal and wonderful who went to school. And now you're only right. cool if you do STEM, apparently <laughs> when they're changing that to STEAM. But back then I decided engineering is going to be tough. So if I could study, then I can, I can do that. So that's how I got right. into undergrad. I also worked at the Department of Defense and I worked at Google during that time for a little bit. So those are some of the experiences. So school, work, and government were all in my head. And um, I didn't like Google. I didn't like, I didn't like it there back in the O's because nobody there was over 30. <laughs> and I, I realized that, and at the time I realized that they only really had one product that ever worked, which was ads. And since then they've yet to launch another product that really makes money. So I thought this is a company, and this is me as, as a kid, I thought this is a company that fails to deliver new products and doesn't hire people over 30. I'm like, this is probably not going to be, you know, it'll be fun, but I'm not going to learn as much as the hype gave you. Mm-hmm. I also worked in the government and that was also in engineering. I got an opportunity to go to one of the three letter agencies and that was going to be my career to do that type of stuff. Failed the polygraph miserably, uh, just <laughs> multiple times, multiple hours. So I will finally come forward with that story at some point. But uh, basically, I am no longer able to work at the three letter agencies because of this, or that's at least my understanding. So I thought, uh, okay, well, that's really like the best engineering job you can get is where I was in those two places on earth like mm-hmm. at Google or these three other agencies. And I was like, okay, well, engineering, I need to diversify my portfolio here because I'm not going <laughs> to go, I'm not going to become world-class as an engineer if I, if, if these two avenues suck. So then for grad school, I went to business. So I went for finance, international business, and that really opened a lot of doors too. So under my undergrad definition, that was a soft major. That was a real soft one. And I was working at the time so I could work and school, you know, obviously didn't require my full attention for grad school, but that's, right. that's how I got into business. Wow. Yeah. And I guess it was maybe around that time that you started keeping these annual goals, right? And you still, you have this list of annual goals you put publicly on your website. You've been updating them every year since 2011. Yeah. How did that practice start? I mean, I guess it, it wraps into, kind of just how you think about setting goals in life and deciding how to uh, spend your time. If the, the so-called two great avenues for engineers are, isn't, isn't the, the road to paradise. Yeah. This is something I started in grad school. I think the book was, I think the book's called 168 hours or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think that's possibly what got me onto this. And what I did was, because college is just, grad school was just such a crazy time for me, school and work and lots of changes in life and moving and all that. And what I did was, is I took a snapshot of my week and I mapped out my 168 hours. And then I snapshotted like the year before or something and I compared them and I did it. I did a diff. I said, I did more hours on this and less hours than that. And I thought, where is, you know, which of these things are having impacts? on routines. For me, if you're not doing it weekly, if you're not writing it down and telling everybody, you're not doing it all. So if your podcast isn't weekly, if your workout routine isn't, doesn't, I mean, it can be more than weekly, but it has to, has to at least be on a weekly schedule. Then that's, that's where habits come from. And I figured that out. And so when I found, I I started with my time. And so I found my time. I said, okay, all the things I'm going to achieve are either going to be fitting into my week, or if they're not going to fit into my week, they need to be so big that they don't fit. But the problem is when you make big goals like that, it's easy to to push them off because if it's not this week, it's next next week and next week never comes. So for my bigger goals, I actually just started writing them down and publishing them. And so those are on my website. And there's, I mean, there's, there's big things. There's little things. One of the, I mean, there's there's all kinds of good stuff here, Mm -hmm. but if you, if you don't write it down, then it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. I also have a book. I always have this book with me. So here's the famous book. 
you know, important meetings going here. And I even write commitments to myself in here. So like, what am I going to do mm-hmm. this month or something? And it's not just because they're private. It's not like I only put the private things in the book. It's, it's just that I didn't feel like they were important enough to publish yet. And, right. you know, you got to make commitments. That's where big things happen from. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, and 168 hours. That's the, that's a book. You also keep track of all the books you read and you have like little reviews. Yeah. Doesn't everybody, is that not a thing? No, <laughs> it should be. It's great to, to see like your, your reflections on the books. I've yeah, decided I mean, not to read a bunch of books just cause, cause you gave <laughs> them a poor review. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't or encapsulated know. like their 300 pages into one sentence <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you really resonate i mean i i don't really like star ratings i think star ratings are going away so i try to put like the words sometimes i really there's just nothing redeeming to say about a book but in general for me if you don't have a pen you can't read yeah I mean, it's got to be interactive words, everything's interactive life is interactive so if you're reading you're doing it wrong you need a pen now, some people, I'm not onto the digital yet. I haven't found the right digital experience. But if you can write, you know, if you can use it digitally, but I, you know, I have piles of books here that are just marked up, you know, I'd, you could you could see them having an argument with the book. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you can see it in real time. Like, I'm fighting it, I'm fighting it, you know, I'm coming around. And then I just take those notes and I mail a letter to the author. Like, you know, send a diff. So... <laughs> This is Sounds this is something you do. If you're not if you're not ever writing to authors, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> now it's rough when the authors are dead, but um, yeah, it, you should definitely be taking yeah. notes when you're reading. Yeah, um, yeah. So let's get into like process for learning new technologies. Like when you encounter a new technology or body of knowledge that you want to learn about, what is what is the the general approach and maybe we could try and take an uh the example of when you first in oh lost you when i first encountered blockchain yeah same approach every time uh, learning is for suckers doing is for winners <laughs> so i think you told me this too with with mm-hmm. china you and i talked about this with chinese so I was Chinese. Um, Remember this discussion forever ago? And yeah. I was like, Dan, um, I'm learning Chinese and I started doing this um, podcast or something, but I'm stuck. I'm stuck between the beginner lessons and the intermediate lessons. The beginner ones are too easy. The inter- intermediate is too hard. And I said, what do you do, Dan? And do you remember what you said? I, I probably said like throw out the lessons, like go talk to people no, 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 no. in you Chinese. Said, no, you said, Fuck it. go to the advanced ones. <laughs> that's exactly what i did <laughs> so, so the 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 progressive learning this is all dumb the the yeah progressive learning is not how you learn that is how kids learn and maybe maybe that's for kids but the adult learning the way you learn as an adult is you do things and so for programming or for technology the answer is you must every time have a project a full MVP. I'm the master of MVP. That's another thing. So mm. MVP, the MVP of learning is producing. So there is no learning for learning's sake. People don't learn things unless you're a kid and kids learn auditorily. So they learn because they like to repeat things through their mouth that they hear through their ears. That's kids are different. Mm. But as an adult, after 12 or something, you learn with the goal of an outcome. And so for technology and things in life, I immediately start with, I want to make. So if the goal is I want to learn how to uh, solder, the answer is not, I want to solder things onto a board. The answer is I want to make, so I just bought this for my, for my daughter's four and we're gonna teach her how to solder. So <laughs> her goal is not, so I got, I got two of these. One of these is for me. So this is surface mount practice. So this one's for me is because I haven't sought it in a year or something. So I'm going to practice on this before I work with her. And then hers is not, I'm going to learn how to solder. It's, I'm going to make a radio. <laughs> and she likes music and she likes radio and she likes different channels. So this is going to be, this is going to be her project. 
So you never, you never tell a kid, well, as a kid, I'd be very mad at it. I'm not going to tell you, hey, let's go learn to solder. It's, hey, let's go make this fun new thing that works when I hit buttons. Mm. And that's how you learn. So for blockchain, same thing. I was, I was, I mean, the, the whole beginning of blockchain is, is a whole way that I got sucked into it. But when I decided that I was going to do NFTs, the thought was, I, I mean, I saw the opportunity of how to get into NFTs and I saw where I needed to fit in, which was the standardization process. But in order to do that, the goal was never to standardize or to learn. It was, I need to build. I need to get right into the making. And so I made my own NFT project as a demo for the future, really for me, for the future me and building things. The story was a little crazy how I started learning. So I decided that I needed to learn Ethereum, blockchain, you know, smart contracts, NFTs, this type of stuff. And so I went on Upwork. I was reading the documentation. The documentation sucked, it just was not usable. And I said, OK, mm -hmm. I'm going to hire somebody. And here's how it's going to work. This person is going to, uh, so I made a job description. I said, you're going to write me hello world in Solidity, which is the programming language. And you're going to give me two hours of one-on-one -on -one chat. And that's going to be enough for me. I can learn anything in two hours with an expert. So that's the pitch. You're going to write me hello world. It's going to compile. You're going to talk to me for two hours. And then I'm going to know this. And I paid three, three grand for this. Wow. $3,000. Who did you talk to? <laughs> well, two hours? I'm in Russia because very few people were available. This market was very mm -hmm. high. So he took my three grand. We scheduled for the next Tuesday. And Monday comes. And he texts me. He sends the money back. He says, sorry, I don't have time for this. The market's too high. <laughs> sends my three grand back to me. <laughs> wow. Like, okay. That's crazy. So if he's if nobody on Upwork is going to take my three grand for two hours of talking to me, then I even more so need to learn this stuff. <laughs> and then I just set the goal. I said, okay, screw smart contracts, screw learning. I'm going to make an NFT. People don't even know what an NFT is at this point. So that's what I'm going to make. I'm going to make this. And I'm going to plow through everything that doesn't work. If the documentation doesn't work, I'm going to fix it. If the compiler doesn't work, I'm going to fix it. If the language is wrong, I'm going to fix it. And I plowed through... The NFTs, I know I'm probably known for the ERC721 part, but the contribution is also the ones that they didn't pass, the competitors to ERC721, which were canceled, the language improvement, the mm. compiler, the standardization process. It's like you're, you're driving a train and then you're building the track in front of you as you're going. Like that's what this was like. And, but I was focused. I knew where I had to get to and I knew everything that was broken and it was just through sheer will in the... I guess in Animal Farm, I'm the horse. So I'm just pushing very, very hard on this. And it worked. But that's also, and people say, well, isn't that the hardest way to learn? Like, isn't there easier ways to learn? No, this is the easiest way to learn. This is how you learn things. Is you, you, you try, I mean, you, you have to be focused. I'm not saying it has to be hard. I'm not saying you have to look at bits and bytes instead of words and paragraphs, but you have to be, you have to have a direction and you have to focus on that. It's like people ask me, how did you learn Chinese? My, my Chinese is pretty decent, especially the pronunciation. And they say, oh, what? I go to China. They're like, how long have you lived in China? I've been like, I've been here for two weeks. Mm -hmm. I don't like <laughs> and the answer is, and they say, well, how do you learn? And so the answer is I play cards. I play cards with people at, back in Philly. And I invite people over and we play this game called uh, Sangua Sha. And I play this oh, right. card game. And that was the reason why is because I wanted to play cards. I didn't really care so much about Chinese. I just, I like cards. And this, in, in the US, we only have Texas Hold'em, which I don't play anymore. So the only way I'm gonna play cards is if I meet other people to play cards. The only people that play cards are Chinese people. And the only cards that they play are this game called uh, uh, Fight the Landlord and uh, this game. So that's how I learned Chinese. And, and, and then, so that's how, that's the question is learning, right? So and yeah. people in China say, okay, well, that's the hardest way to learn. I said, no, that's the easiest way to learn. That's the only way to learn. Class is for suckers. So <laughs> going to school is not how you learn things as an adult. Now as a child, again, class is great until about 12. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think this kind of reminds me of like my first year of college. 
so I went to I went to like uh, the U.S. when I was 18, and then like my English like was not good at all. So at the time, and I only learned from like the books, you know, uh, sort of the tests. And then the first year, my college only uh, I'm the only Chinese people in in my dorm. So there's 12 people. Yeah,、uh, we're living in a suit.、Uh, we're, we're living in a suite, and then, and then like the first year, like my English improved so much. You know, like I, I know a lot of stuff and know how to speak and know how to、uh, say those words in a particular way that people understand. That instead of like a book、uh, English, so yeah, it's like is exactly you go into do 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 the stuff, and then you can learn、uh, way quickly.、Uh, then they just. Stay at home.、Uh, well, let me let me、something. compare that to my roommate. So my roommate was Chinese when I was living in Philly, and、mm-hmm. she did not want to learn. That was not her goal, and she managed to get through two years of grad school in Philadelphia, and not learn English at all. Yeah, feeding on every、wow. test, <laughs> refusing to mingle. She、mm-hmm. had other goals、I、in、see. life. She wanted to get married in the U.S. That was <laughs> really her goal, <laughs> and. To a Chinese person, for reasons, and、um, so I'm saying, like, don't just say because you showed up here is that's why you won. Right. So Michael didn't win because you just landed here. You land. You you won because you decided that you're gonna win. You're right. Right. Yeah, and you engaged. You could、yeah. have just went and found a bunch of other Chinese students, and yeah. Had, But that would be too、uh, sad you know, for me every day. <laughs> too sad. <laughs> <laughs> no,、yeah. like I mean, that would be like yeah. So I, I wanted to, you know, it's a more.、Uh, I wanted to know like their life. You know, it's still different at the time. I was really curious, and then, and then I was like, I wanted to join their conversation instead of just sitting in my room. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but I know a lot of friends that you know they kind of afraid you know of of new environment. And then so so they just、uh, you know kind of have this habit not talking too much sometimes, and which I think is really bad、uh, for themselves, like for their personal development. Yeah. Yeah.、All、right. So maybe let's、uh, like after so you, since you introduced like the the learning process of、uh, getting to know blockchain and. You learned that really fast, <laughs> and like you, you came out with the ERC seven two one, which is so、uh, groundbreaking. And I'm actually really curious about like the process of, you know, how do you,、uh, what kind of、uh, consideration that went into it when you're trying to、uh, build the NFT standards? And did you know at the time that this will be like such a having such a big impact and become so popular afterwards? And you can we want to talk more more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I did expect this would be this big. I expect it to be bigger in different ways, in boring ways, not like money ways or getting rich ways. Just pervasive, pervasiveness. And that's my vision for NFT is pretty expansive. I think it's going to change commerce, you know, wholly. But in ways that people don't even notice, which is fine. And so that was that was what I thought about it coming in. The process, the paper itself. So that we're talking about this paper called ERC721, which is the specification for NFTs on blockchain. You can actually do NFTs without blockchain, but these are the ones that are on blockchain, which is mostly where people recognize them. And so my contribution academically here is, is to help write this paper. So I'm the lead author of this paper. We have four authors, and the paper just explains technically how do you do this on Ethereum. And then there's a lot of explanation on why we made these choices. Now, that's the paper. The paper is it's okay, and you know if I could if I could write it again by myself, I would have you know there's things I would do differently. It's not it's not perfect, and there's not going to be a version two. The reason why is because the whole point of this paper is to make everybody agree on the specification. So the cool thing about this paper is that there is not a competing one, and that people that want to do this thing are all compatible. So If you're making one of these things and I'm making one, they can both be traded with each other using compatible software. These are called marketplaces or places that you buy and sell NFTs. So really, the process here was a little bit technical, like making it work and testing, and that was that was half of it. And the other half was entirely political. 
getting people to agree and to adopt this. This was the only standard, I believe, on Ethereum at the time, or maybe still, that was accept accepted unanimously. So everybody agreed. So everybody who participated agreed that this was the way forward for this. And that was the accomplishment. Because if you want things to be compatible, you don't want somebody forking you or stepping aside with a competing standard. So the process here, the way that I learned and the way that I did this, I did a couple things. Everybody was here and they wanted this to proceed. Everybody wanted NFTs in this space. Everybody in this space of developers with Ethereum, making blockchain stuff. In the, in the scene that I was in, they, they wanted a path forward for NFTs. And you're not seeing my hands. I'm not, you're only getting half the conversation. There we go. <laughs> so everybody was here and they agreed that they wanted a path forward. Problem was this process was moving too slowly. And some people were embarrassed to talk because they were new here. So this is, this is the pitch I gave. They went from not knowing anything on the scene to being in the middle of NFTs. Here's my pitch. I said, my pitch is, I'm going to iterate quickly on this. We're going to make new drafts every time there's an improvement. So we're going to get to the goal as fast as possible because we're going to keep iterating. And I have a lot of time for this. I'm going to dedicate time. I'm going to work any time zone to get this done. And number two is, I'm going to give all of you my phone number. So I'm going to talk to you individually. If there's anything you want to say, I will hear every one of your ideas. Sometimes as, as programmers, it's very easy to get theoretical and like, this is the best approach or all the ideas suck because they're not mine. Mm -hmm. And some of that is rooted in the fact that some engineers don't communicate enough. So they're not sharing their ideas. So really, if you if it's called not invented here syndrome and there's places that are famous for it, I think this speaks to a lower human wanting to communicate. So as, as an engineer, it manifests as, oh, I'm not, I want to be communicating. So the way I communicate is by having this complete product, this idea that I deliver myself, mm -hmm. and that is my communication. And I'm not going to share anything until that. And maybe that's, maybe that's too right. polite or whatever. But on the outside, the way you see that is, this is somebody who's not a team player. They're not communicating, and they're, not, and they're reinventing everything all the time. But it's the same human feeling. Another way is if you can pull these people out of the tunnel and talk to them, then you can get those same ideas earlier and put them into a product that more people are going to use rather than waiting for them to finish. I think it's the same mm -hmm. thing. I think this is a engineer specific way of manifestation of, I want to communicate is mm -hmm. that not ends up as not invented here. So I sort of recognize that because I saw it happening. I saw some people taking ideas, burrowing away, working on a big project. And this is unacceptable. You can't have multiple NFT standards in 2017. It would not result in what we got out of it. So I said, okay, if you have these ideas and you don't want to share them to publicly in a wide audience, just call me. Here's my phone number. Anybody on the scene of NFTs from 2018 has my phone number. And we talk through it, A to Z. And the people, they're smart people. Sometimes they just weren't expect, you know, ready for criticism. They hadn't been in open source before. And that was the solution. So by talking to people on the phone, making drafts constantly, I was able to navigate this, not to the best product, not to how I would have wrote it myself, not to the thing that everybody needed, but instead to the thing that had zero dissent and was good enough to publish and that as fast as possible. And that was, that was the product. Delivered fast with everybody agreeing and it's been around and it'll be around for years and it, it unlocked what we got. That is actually pretty uh, in, impressive. So, because I, for like, for the first time when I was uh, in the uh, trying to learn stuff and I learned the whole blockchain, joined the community, it was, my sense was that there are so many uh, smart developers like <laughs> working in there and they have to be smart to work on some of the projects. So you have to have like, uh, you know, be, become a polymath to, to learn stuff by yourself. And then, yeah, I'm not sure, like, you know, like after you see, saw, see this stuff, like the whole process, that's actually what drove, you know, to put them together and drove them into progress. So because like open source community is such, you know, it's, it's, it's at the same time, it's pretty uh, creative, but it's also scattered. So like, so how do you build stuff? So you still need like what, what you did for the uh, NFT uh, community and also the process. 
having that process to 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 make it work yeah and and also like uh even even uh so like is there any uh right now like uh uh, particular uh, aspect of blockchain that you uh, or NFT that you currently picks your curiosity or is the kind of uh, is your current research subject of your research that you're trying to work on? Yep, for NFTs, I'm focused on the long term, which is just making better <clears throat> products in the real world. So the digital NFTs are less interesting to me. Physical NFTs are way more interesting, and so you buy a thing and then you can verify that it's authentic or you can verify that it seller claims. So I, I, I spelled out basically my goal is that I want to make things that you buy able to be verified. You can verify the authenticity and the seller claims. And that's that's really wide ranging. So that includes a lot of different angles. That includes checking the contents of things, verifying, you know, if, if you buy something and it says, oh, this is carbon neutral. It's really easy to just put a sticker. This is carbon neutral. And I don't care specifically about carbon neutral. This is just one example. So you buy a thing that says carbon neutral. Well, it would be better if there was a QR code and the person who certified that as carbon neutral said that, not just the person selling you the thing. So, you know, when you buy stocks, when you buy equities, the equities are registered. And you can verify there's a website in the United States for all the exchanges and in Hong Kong and other places. And you can say, this is a registered security. When you see that this is a registered security and you know all the rules that are attached to securities, you know, all the anti-fraud things, you can be confident that you're buying a legitimate thing. But don't listen to the person calling you to self-certify. That's not mm -hmm. gonna, they're not a reliable person to be certifying their stuff. Certification be third, should be third party. So when you buy stuff, the certifications should be verifiable. This whole process of verifying things ties directly into NFTs. Right, and I think there there are some some of the uh, this the the concept where because I but in China like I sometime I I saw like I think couple I don't remember what but I think some milk or something they already starting to doing that kind of stuff but I'm yeah. not sure that they are really like using like. <laughs> Let's say working on uh, Ethereum or whatever uh, public blockchain, but they they kind of like embracing the concept of trying to you know just get verified directly from the source, uh, and and to have that uh, you know so you're more safe and having more security on, on what you kind of buy and, and purchase. I think China is a great place to for the next phase of NFTs. I think that would be great. I was just in China and I did not see that on any milk that I bought. I would love to see that. And China's got this nice, China has a reputation for food quality issues. And yeah, I, right. I think, I don't know if it's in the five-year plan now, but I, China can pick up a focus on these things and work very hard across verticals to achieve the solution. Right. So that's why I think uh, China's good for this. The US, US is interesting too, but it's much more fragmented and it can take many more years to achieve something like this. And the result will also be fragmented. So you won't have one thing that works in a lot of places. China, it will work with WeChat and it will work for everything, you know, in one month. Yeah, right. And then people Hopefully. will get in trouble. And if they make milk <laughs> that's bad for you, milk powder, then they kill you. They literally kill you. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, right, right. You make milk powder yeah. with bad stuff in it, they literally execute you. Yeah, so, the, the, yeah there was like huge accident, like uh, I think it's 10 years ago. For like yeah, the yeah. baby uh milk potter and then mm -hmm. and then that that kind of like just bring a lot of uh, social like uh angers towards the whole industry yeah yeah so you gotta you gotta harness that anger to to make political right. you know difficult decisions like requiring industry to do things make better products but in the u.s you can see all the time there's fraud and there's rarely any consequences at the highest level right but yeah, right. so the whole point so, of NFT in this scenario is accountability. So the question is, your question is, where do I look to the future for the NFT? The future of NFT is accountability for commerce in general, big mm -hmm. types of commerce. There's also going to be a lot of performance tickets that are going to be NFTs. <laughs> yeah, That's going to be a major consumer facing application, specifically mm -hmm. in the entertainment industry. You're going to see a lot more connection between individual fans and the artist. 
And that's going to lead to all of the things we've been doing on with digital NFTs and pictures of animals and parties for people that have pictures of animals. All that stuff, all the best parts of that, if there's any, are going to directly come to mainstream with people that go to concerts. Edit right. that out. Edit that out. <laughs> people that go to creative performances. Uh, <laughs> the biggest names in these industries are, are working for creative performances are going to have all new types of engagement. And this is really good stuff. Yeah, great. Yes. Yeah, so, so you touched a little bit about um, in, in bringing ERC721 together, uh, you know, corralling open source communities. Uh, how, how did you first get exposed to that? I guess, you know, you mentioned BBSs, which were like a, a, a prototypical type of open source community, but like, yeah, how, how did you get engaged with them over time? And what are your core principles? Because you have a, a really uh, active GitHub with all kinds of stuff ranging from, I don't know, things for radios to apps to, I guess somewhere in there, your solidity, hello world. <laughs> So my first Contract. experience yeah. with open source was with, with, with Linux in high school. So a friend who now also works at Google got me, got me onto, it was either Red Hat or Gen 2 or something, or whatever the other version of Red Hat was called back then. And Fedora? No, it was before Fedora. And this is my first experience with open source. So I had, I had a computer, it was running Windows, and I decided I'm going to scrap it and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do Linux. And there's an XKCD for this, but basically it gets worse and worse as you're installing it and like not even <laughs> to hacking it. And this is what happened to me. So I'm trying to install Linux, but halfway through, I realized that I didn't have internet access because the the module, the kernel module for the Ethernet driver didn't work. And it was the RT87 something, a really 8739, a really popular Ethernet driver. And I had that card. I didn't have like this weird card, but a popular card, and for some reason it didn't work. And I was, I had taken C in school. It was just, a, just enough programming that I knew on this day to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So I'm literally, so my first experience with open source is I'm literally compiling the kernel. It didn't work and it spits out a wall of errors, just like blah, 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 blah. So I scrolled up and I found the first error. I'm like, well, that's the one that I need to fix. And it was, it was magical that this worked out this way, but I actually fixed the problem. It was, there's a typo in one of the pre-compiler directives, one of the include statements that on this architecture, cause I had like the I-686 and there was the I-586, whatever it was. And I just fixed one of the things and it compiled and I got on the internet. <laughs> and then I said, okay, well, you know, I fixed the thing and I wrote down what it is that I fixed. And I said, okay, well, I guess what I'm supposed to do is share the fix. So I got on the internet, I did all my like computer setup stuff on Linux, and then I found the project, which was a mailing list or it was either a mailing list or an IRC back then. And then I went in there and I found the maintainer for whatever this module was. And I said, hey, I would like to contribute this fix. And then here's the thing that it was, and here's what it is. And I didn't use a patch. I didn't know how the right way to say, articulate what I was doing. I said, here's mm -hmm. the fix, and it worked for me. And I said, <laughs> and I included it in the Linux kernel. So my first contribution on OSS was getting a commit into the kernel, which is mm. ridiculous nowadays. But yeah. um, and it worked. So I'm not I'm not saying like how awesome it was. It was really just a one line fix. But the the, the story is that I got the whole closed loop. So I had the problem, I fixed it. I was lucky enough that I could figure it out. It worked. I got online. I was still using Linux. I found the person. I let them know. They accepted it, and they put it in a new version of Linux. That is the cycle that you need for open source. That's the whole point. And that was the first thing that I learned. I didn't ever study. I actually have a book now on open source, whatever, but from business school. But it's like, <laughs> that's the whole point. It's like when you learn religion, they say the whole point of, I don't know if this is a Jewish quote or something, but it's the whole point of religion is love. I don't know who I'm quoting on this, but every, every, love, religion. <laughs> every religion. So if you understand love, then you, you're, you're basically done with religion. 
And the religion is a process to teach you love. So that's the thing. So I just skipped all of the religion part and I went straight straight to the love because that was, <laughs> that was the cycle. That was the loop, the whole thing. And I said, okay, well, this is the future of technology, collaboration, working across borders. Remember, this is also back 90s or something. You didn't have pen pals across borders. You talked to people that you knew back then. So this mm -hmm. is me talking to a stranger far away on a different time zone like all those elements lined up. And then I realized this is what the future is like. This is what science is like. And it, it's fast. The whole thing is you don't have to, you don't have to be qual you don't have to be an expert to do science. You don't have to be published. You don't have to be in a journal to do science. You just have to follow this process. And this is science. So for me, the understanding of science was getting this one line of code fix in the kernel in the Linux kernel. And then I took this experience forward for everything with open source. Mm. Yeah. And I guess like open source has evolved since then. What is the process like today? I mean, it's I guess that different. that general loop is the same, but yeah. the uh, I'm sure like th things have evolved. Projects are tend to be much more or many of them are much more organized. There's a lot of kind of uh, norms and complexities that have popped up i think very little has changed since decades mm. ago of open source mm -hmm. maybe more people are using github than mailing lists for better and worse there's it's a lot i i really don't think the process has changed i'm gonna say it like this it has not changed at all it's just mm. that more people are aware of it now mm -hmm. and with the awareness is bringing more contributors so there's lots of casual contributors people that are not going to make a, a career in software, contributing to software, more tinkering, people that want a thing, but they don't want to wait for the software to come out. Like, let's talk about AI. So there's a lot of people or AI. Um, there's a lot of people that want to do AI, machine learning, uh, people that want to do neural network programming. And they're not, the tools aren't out yet. The consumer tools are just not there yet. So they have to follow some guide in order to get it to work. Like that level of engagement is bringing people in that, are not, let's say, professional contributors to these type of projects. In the past, there right. were a lot more professional contributors. Now there's a lot more casual people. So the people have changed. The process, the technology is identical. There's different names we were using. Uh, CVS, or, um, then we were using you know, sub Subversion, now we're using Git, probably mm -hmm. gonna use Git forever, but they're the same thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically nothing's changed. The people have changed. Yeah, the people have changed. And that's, where do you see it going? Do you see open source eating the world? There's, um, yeah. and you know, there's this uh, debate in, now that we're on, on the AI stuff, you know, open models versus proprietary models. Yeah, I don't know if we're allowed right. to talk about that Google leaked memo, but that's that's the one. I well, I didn't say it. You said it. There you go. So <laughs> there's a leaked memo from Google discussing the the comparison of basically it says that the future of neural network products is going to come from open source. Open source is eating Google's lunch. There's really no path forward for Google to make a competitive product when the progress from the open collaboration world is 10x faster. And it just, it, it goes to market way faster. Some people, I remember a long time ago, sometimes communism was attached to open source. They were saying that it's, it's the <laughs> communist approach and the closed source <laughs> software is, is the capitalist approach. Because <laughs> if you look at the word capitalism, capital means you're going to create an asset that's valuable, capital and you're going to drive a profit from that asset. But open source software is free, therefore it is not an asset that you own. It kind of lines up, it kind of lines up that open source is communism and products, but- <laughs> well, solution, Socialism may be more right. apt. But, and it's, so this, this is just it's from long ago, this is what the way that people are talking about it. Nobody talks like this right. anymore, nobody says that anymore. And we're just focused on the outcomes, not the not the ideology, not the why are people doing it this way. It's just it is way more effective. 
it is 10x more effective every time. The products mm -hmm. are better, the, it brings people in faster. And so you just need to adapt to that. You need to make businesses that thrive in this future rather than making businesses that suck. And again, that's why I left Google is because they don't know how to make businesses. They've only ever made one product that works and they're just not business people. They, don't, they didn't figure this out. Luckily, this, this leaked memo shows that somebody in there has a brain and is thinking about, you know, how can stuff, how can we adapt to this future? How can we, how can we be alive in this future where open source software is, is, is the path forward and Google, who invested a crazy amount of money in neural networks with the, with the TensorFlow processing unit, like they made their own silicon even before Apple brought it to the masses, still couldn't get an edge. Yeah. I think it's um it's going to be really interesting to see how all this stuff plays out. I think there's um I mean there are definitely like counter arguments to what what you described and I I I do tend to think that like there's something about if you're doing enterprise stuff that it's like companies uh how they make decisions on service providers and like what they trust. Um, if there's like, if there's a customer service engineer, they can talk to like those, those kinds of things make a difference because that ends up like what's in, you know, the back end to the big consumer products that, you know, everybody's using. Um, and I, I, I still don't know, like I go back and forth, uh, proprietary versus open source um you know you you kind of um Im implied that or or kind of assented to my uh idea that you know is open source eating the world or going to eat the world but yeah the answer is yes open source eats the world and also your question before or your your comment before about you know companies need services companies need customer support that's the answer. Open source doesn't do customer support. And there is, there is room for businesses. There's room for making money. There's room for building brands that is compatible with open source software. The way that software is gonna work, software is a open source thing that is eating the world. And I'll give you two examples that you're saying, haven't we been saying this forever? So I'll give you those two examples of where, where they're great examples. Okay, so the one, now back to the business. So yeah, so the future of, it's really not about the future of software. Nobody cares about software. People care about products. People care about business. And so yeah, the future of business is not to be replaced by open source. That doesn't make sense. You're not gonna start buying your office software from a bunch of people that don't answer your phone call when things break. <laughs> like that's not what yeah. companies need. So they need, soft, they need support, even if the support is terrible and it's delivered by underqualified people, like even, even the worst possible imaginable support, as, lo as long as it's better than an AI chatbot, um, as, as long as it's a real human, even subpar, then they will pay for that. So uh, for now. For now, for now. Right. <laughs> but for businesses, that there is there's definitely you're paying for the brand. The product, it doesn't really matter if the product is capitalism owned by the product by the company or socialism, uh, communism owned by some community. That, that doesn't matter. People don't care about that philosophy. They care about the product. And so, yeah, businesses that work with open source will thrive. Now, the question is, haven't we, have we been saying this forever? One of the quotes is, is this the year of the Linux desktop? The <laughs> this is the year that Linux takes over Windows. This is the year that Linux takes over Windows. And then in all this time people have been talking about this, Mac just took over everything. So Apple right. took over everything. With Unix. Right. <laughs> right, with Unix. So there's really two things that people have been saying forever, two really out there projects from GNU, which is with Richard Stallman, who is just so communist or whatever, on the other side of everything that just really strives to connect to the real world. Two of the things from the GNU world were GNU herd. So is GNU herd going to be the future? 
the new operating system from scratch, built under open source, without any influences from the outside world. And it was based on microarchitecture. This is a technical decision. And basically the end result is this is what Apple now uses. So this whole mm -hmm. magical product that people wanted is now used by the whole world, billions of people, because Apple brought it forward. And Apple brought Apple's kind of their walled garden approach, but they do make the minimum amount of improvements to open source that they can. They also have managed to keep a lot of things private. But the, all the ideas were stolen anyway because they went to Android with the <laughs> same idea. And the second thing, which just happened this year, is so many people were thinking, oh, there's another project called GNU Social, which is a new social network based on magical open platforms that are just interoperable and perfect like email and not subject to the influences of the powers that be. And this week, a major company in this industry launched a product that supposedly will be compatible with this in the future. So GNU mm -hmm. Social became, and, and Pump was one of the programs that did this. Basically, we have something called ActivityPub now, which is a potential competitor to social networks out there. And this is the open, open source design and intercompatible and all these things. And now Meta comes out with threads that purports to be compatible with this. So these are two major achievements in the open source world that people thought would take decades to come. And it just happens to be that this is the decade that they came. So mm -hmm. yes, we have been saying it forever. And now we need new goals to aspire to because the goals that we've been working on have been achieved. Mm -hmm. But no, it does not make businesses obsolete or money obsolete or any of that stuff. Yeah. Great. Um, one one last thing I wanted to make sure we cover was you and I do this community service hour um, that we co-host every week. And uh, I've never asked you, what, what do you get out of that experience? And um, how do you think your live streaming skills have developed over the course of well i get a lot out of it it's it's a nice way to it's a nice way to connect with people is to have a show a public show i do advisory so i help businesses implement a lot of the stuff we're talking about and that's that's i make money off of that and so it's a nice differentiator do you want to have a private conversation where you're going to be paying me or do you want to have a public conversation where i'm going to publish it and that, that's a nice differentiator because a lot of people you know, our businesses that don't want to pay for things. So making it public is a really easy way to just differentiate the community world versus the work world. Mm. And more businesses should just show up and get the advice for free on the call. Just <laughs> run with it. But a lot of businesses would don't tell anyone to <laughs> be private. Like my idea is so, so secret. Like your idea, there's 10 other people that have the same idea. It's the ideas are not special. It's the execution is special. So for me, it's, it's very nice to separate those two parts of who I talk to, you know, the, the clients and the private stuff versus the public stuff that I publish. That's, I get, that's, that's a tangible value. I mean, I talk to a lot of people and I get quite a bit of DMs and I don't like saying no to people when they want help. You know, if I can help people, especially if it's part of my vision that I'm trying to change the world, you know, I want to help people. And um, putting that into a one hour box each week really helps me clear up my week and stay focused. Um, so that's a very practical thing. Um, two, is it's, it's helping me to make some blog posts, you know, to articulate mm -hmm. better some of these ideas. You know, we have had a couple of these themes on community service hour where the themes come along a few times. One of them is like blockchain is not decentralized. Something mm -hmm. people don't understand. And so we've touched a few times, but eventually we've said enough that it, it can be a blog post right. and that that is the word on the subject. So it's, it's nice as a column to bring themes up over and over. Plus it's just the way that people work, you know, is, is really the way that you achieve solutions to just talk about something and make it or talk about something and then publish a blog? No, these are discussions. As you bring in more people, you know, we've got a crew, we've got a dedicated faithful crew of people that show up and they're just different perspectives. Neural networks, one of the great things that will come from neural networks is simulating different perspectives. Mm -hmm. you know I mean? That's a major thing that will come out. You know, if you've got to meet, we talk about diversity, diversity, diversity. And Harvard had a major lawsuit about diversity, and that one just cleared through the Supreme Court. And then the next day, a second one came, continuing that angle. So mm -hmm. diversity is a great thing. You can simulate some of it. 
So you can just bring people into your meeting with extremely diverse opinions. And, um, but we do that automatically with Community Service Hour. I'm not, I'm not placing these, these people with robots, but we get some really diverse opinions from all parts of life and humanity yeah. in that call. And mm -hmm. it's great. It's great because you really need you really need that to get to where you're going. So same thing. If you're publishing products yourself or you're writing blog posts, there's there's a proclivity to just go off of your own angles. But if you have a weekly call, if you have this bouncing back, you really exposes you to the diversity of ideas that you need to get better. That's why I get yeah. out of it. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I get uh, a lot of those those things too. I don't know if he's going to be back. Yeah, he says <clears throat> maybe I'll do the wrap off for us. Yeah. Yeah, maybe like just just one uh, maybe last uh, thing that like how should folks follow you and uh, hear more, more about you, like what you do and then keep following you and uh, interact with you. Following is easy. So that's, I have a website called 4.net. Can I type here? Boom. Sure. So there's that. Yeah, we're, sure, we're sure that in the description as well. Yeah. Yep. So 4.net, there's a bunch of places you can click follow and a bunch of those things. There's an email list that's, you know, you get an email once, once a month from me to just summarize all that stuff. But better is, uh, I want to hear from you, you know, more alpha for me, right? So show up, ask mm -hmm. your questions, introduce yourself. You know, that's really the whole point. I think following is overrated. You know, interacting is underrated. So show up. I have the community service hour. Just bring in all these topics are in scope. Don't be shy. Just show up and, um, you know, bring your perspective on this stuff. Uh, I'm here to help you. I'm here to push my vision forward and then, you know, expand what I know too. So um, there's that too. So we've got that. That is, there's hour.gg, hour like a uh, um, minute hour, hour dot, it's community service hour. So hour.gg. And um, yeah, be in touch. All right. Yeah. Just, don't forget to check check them out. Uh, we we will also leave in in the description. Also, like we'll tweet about them <laughs> as well. Uh, yeah. And uh, all right. So wrap it up. Uh, our guest today has been William Intrican, and well, thanks for being part of the craft. And uh, really appreciate it and learn a lot from you. And um, and also for those uh, of you who are listening, and thank you for uh, listening to the craft podcast. And for more links and uh, information about this episode or to listen to more episodes, you can search for uh, The Craft Podcast by Daniel Tedesco and Michael Dew on YouTube and, or anywhere you get your podcast. And uh, see you next time. And until then, keep crafting.